Welcome to Law and Justice. I'm Jane Mulcahy. This is a special series on the topic of relationships matter. And today I'm joined by Jerry Diamond. Hi, Jerry. How are you? Nice to meet you, Jane. It's an I'm... absolute privilege to be invited onto your podcast. I've seen so many big names on it. I mean, yes, and you're the latest one. I thought I'm down. I'm down near the bottom. A Premier League of. Oh no, of no, no. I'm so Dr. excited. Perry, to... Stephen Porges, you would from Scotland, you would James Docker, you would James on it, and um, Pauline Scott. So That's right. Pauline That's an elite right. group. Yeah, no, there's some amazing people in Scotland doing tremendous work on on this type of topic. You know, where they understand that relationships are at the core, really, of of everything. Um, but no, I'm very pleased to have you on, Jerry. I've I've had you in my mind for a while because I love you on Twitter and share all your graphics and your reflections. So can you just tell me a bit about yourself, please? Yeah, well, obviously my name's Jerry Diamond and I am from Scotland, as you can tell with the voice. So I'll try to talk <laughs> as slow as I possibly can, but we're quite similar to the Irish. We're quite we're quite fast, quite fast at talking. Um yeah, so my name's Jerry Diamond. I work in Claybank High School in Scotland. We are quite a, an area of high deprivation. Um, the main role that I've been in for the last um, six years is, um, I've done some work before that, but I've been put into a role as, as nurture lead. Um, so we decided about six years ago, we would, our, S1, our pupils just coming from primary to high school, okay. we thought we'd need to put in some early intervention work because not all young people adjust too well coming from the primary school environment to high school environment. It's a big step from some schools. You could say they've got 200 pupils and sure. you're coming to a school with, what we have in our school is about 1,450. So wow. it's a big step. So, and you've also got their social and emotional behavioural development they're carrying as well. So I've been, been in this role for about six years now and it's been going really well. And we've won a few awards along with it. Um, but that's okay. the other part of my role with Nurture, so we've got pupils every morning, it's an early intervention, and um, they come every morning with us, so part of the Nurture process is when they come in the morning, they get their breakfast, we have toast and tea around the table, we have a discussion, a wee chat about how their days went or how yesterday went, but the big point on it, and we'll probably knock on this through our conversation today, relationships are so crucial mm. regarding the young people who come to Nurture. Um, so part of my role is Nurture, Part of my role, I am a, a licensed partner with um, Friends Resilience. So I run a resilience CBT program as well um, with many, many pupils. So that's open to every pupil. Nurture is kind of a selected pupil who really, really need it. Um, the, resilience pupil, the resilience group is open to all pupils. And they give the young people skills of, um, it gives them physio, skills from, really the program focuses on physiological learning, attachment, mm -hmm cognitive, all these skills put together. So that's a 10 week intervention that these young people can access a, a, a really a nice toolbox for them. Um, so they're learning about on top of that, learning about regulation, dysregulation, learning about the brain, learning about parts of the brain, their prefrontal cortex, their amygdala, their mm -hmm. um, limbic system, brain stems, and how to regulate. But part of my role in that is learning them co-regulating with them. So they, yeah. they learn co-regulation with me. On top of that, um, the school mindfulness lead, Okay. So I also I also teach pupils mindfulness. Um, so they teach them resilience and they get the extra package of teaching them resilience. So they will go through. Resilience is a 10-week program. Um, mindful, so resilience is a 10-week program. Mindfulness is also 10-week. Um, so the kids will learn so much through all these interventions in the school and the, the mindfulness program is open to all. Part of my role as a mindfulness lead, not only training the pupils, but also put the teachers through twilight sessions. Mm -hmm. And that's coming after school. And now and now put them through a 10 week program for their own self care, which is yeah. crucial. It is. So there's quite a bit, there's quite a bit I'm doing there. Yeah, quite a bit. And you've a lovely brain there in the background. I've seen that brain have, before on Twitter. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. Do, do the kids like learning about the brain, Jerry? What I always say, Jane, is um, yeah, they're totally, they're totally. They're totally into it, and it's so easy to explain. And it's some pupils picking up things visually tend mm. to take it in better. So that brain, as well as I was kind of showing you earlier, I've got another one here. Yeah, it's amazing. The, the pupils will learn off this as well. So I can break this apart, like take off the 
the they cortex. They see the brain stem there, yeah, and the, the cortex, cortex is gone. They make it down to the limbic area, down to yeah. the brain stem, and we build it, and they build it themselves. And when they're building it, we will go through all the different parts and what impact they have on our behaviour. Yeah. It's amazing. I think everyone should know a bit more about the brain because we Absolutely. think we're more rational than we are. We're only rational when we're safe and regulated. And yeah. um, on safety, Jerry, you know, as someone in education, as a, as a teacher and nurture lead now and mindfulness guru and everything else, re resilience instructor, what's your understanding of how our felt sense of safety as a, as a baby and small child and the quality of our attachment relationship impacts how we function, not just in childhood, but down the road? So crucial, isn't it? Relationships to me are top. Everything else comes underneath. Mm -hmm. Especially with with the, it doesn't matter if the, the young person has got um, adverse childhood experiences or they're coming from a a, a nice environment. Whatever. I think relationships are are so crucial with any any people. <laughs> they're so important to us as adults because mm -hmm. we need to manage our relationships as well. But a part of well, say a part of relationships and the importance of relationships is self-regulation. Mm -hmm. I think it's so crucial because as human beings, we need to, regulation is so important, um, especially the role I'm in, because mm -hmm. I can have so many dysregulated young people and that's the language that we use in our school. Mm -hmm. We don't ask people, can you calm down? We yeah. use the language of regulation and dysregulation because I know you'll probably think, so if anyone tells me to calm down, doesn't work. I will generally not, <laughs> I will not calm down. I'll go in the other direction. I, I so with you. The language of, are we regulated? Yeah. And the people then will become curious. What mm. does regulation mean? Mm. I'll still hear what it means. And then we go through a conversation with that. So mm. absolutely, uh, feel a sense of safety. Um, pupils will pick up on dysregulation. Pupils will know. Mm. Your husband or your wife will know when you're dysregulated. Mm. So mm. kids... Especially kids from trauma, they will pick up on mm. when you're dysregulated. They'll, they'll, they'll know. So I think strong childhood attachment is so important. And I think that's beginning with the adults and the, the young child's life. Um, if we can present, provide a sense of control, a sense of safety, then I think that um, their destiny is going to be a lot better than, than all the adversity goes on. So it is about relationships and, mm. and providing a sense of a sense of safety, a sense of um, compassion, all of these things bundled into mm. the one basket. And do you think that we sometimes take for granted in mainstream schools that they're safe? You know, we presume they're safe because maybe we feel safe there as an adult or a child, but someone else might have come from chaos and shouting and roaring and maybe hunger in the morning and they don't feel safe because they carry a sense of kind of dysregulation with them right. pretty much at all times, maybe. Well, our staff are quite up, I, I would, our staff are well up to date now. We've done so much to, to, to looking into the science. Um, we've run, um, a, a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic, we, we ran a, a Nurture and Positive Relationships Festival. Before that, we had some guest speakers in as well, just, just letting staff understand that all these ch children that are coming into school and particularly in Clay Bank, which is a mm. higher deprivation, they're coming into school. I always call it an emotional backpack. Mm. They've got, they've got, and um, they're carrying this bag, and it can be heavy, and it's got so many rocks in it that mm -hmm. it's but unloading that burden. So we need to understand as well about how these young people are feeling. Um, so we ran a, a, a learning festival, which was absolutely massive. Um, so we invited Suzanne Zidike in, oh, yeah. and we invited James Docker to him. So we went from. We went from the science, and, and, and I'll give James. James is absolutely a James is an inspiration to me. When I see James's yeah. journey, I mean, I look when, when I see James, and that's how I was like, right away, we need James into the school because mm -hmm. James brings so much. Not mm -hmm. only his lived experience, but James understands the science as well. James is very good. James really up to speed with the science, and I've stole a lot of his stuff. <laughs> and, but that's what it's all about. But yeah. that's what it's all about. Um, so we ran a festival, we had 600 people at it over the day. We had about 45 um, stalls in the hall with all different information. 
We obviously with Suzanne up talking a little bit science and people a bit, a bit curious about behaviour, and then yeah. with James up talking about about lived experience and how his nervous system was, was dysregulated, and he couldn't sit in class, you couldn't focus and manage. Um, yeah. So the staff get that, mm-hmm. they get that in this school. Um, so yeah, we don't. Yeah. Your staff are lucky. Things. Your staff are lucky because when you are dealing with um, a cohort of kids that just are bringing more in their emotional backpack than others. Yes. Um, but the other thing is you could be from a, a fine middle class household, you know, with super professional parents and still be carrying a lot of emotional neglect or abuse and other things with you. Totally agree with you 100 percent, Jane, because parents may be working that hard. Mm. They may forget that what other things have got to be doing with their kids. I mean, mm. the gay parents, like parents are maybe out working to make really out working hard both parents and the kids are kind of lost a wee bit and they're not having that yeah. relation relational wealth as Bruce yeah. Perry would call it mm. they may got all the they may be, they may got all the, the nice clothes and whatever but the holiday loving relationships yeah we, we we can't really thrive without them sure we can't Jerry none of us yeah. no absolutely and then so you've touched on how teaching has this inherently strong relational component but um, Dr. Gordon Neufeld, uh, he's a lovely talk about relationships um, matter or is it relation, relationships matter. That's the name of this podcast. It's something along the lines, the S is in a different place. But anyway, yeah. he says that learning follows attachment. Would you agree with that, Jerry? Why would I not agree? Why would <laughs> yeah. I not agree? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I did watch his podcast and absolutely yeah. scribbled a wee note down somewhere. What does it say? You need you need you need the heart before you can access the mind. Yeah. So I had to scribble that down. And ain't that so true? Mm. Ain't that so true? Because and what I always what I always look at it was look at the Maslow hierarchy. Yeah. And, and the one that I always use, um, the one that I always tend to use is um a children's psychological needs must be met before learning can take place. Mm. So absolutely we have to have these the kids on board with the relationships and meet them first. Sometimes we need them. We need to meet them first where they're at, yeah. because um, no all kids are coming to school again with adversity. And I always look. We always talk about expectations, and do our expectations meet their um, psychology, meet, mirror their brain development? Yeah. So what we we really look at that as well. That we're not setting pupils' expectations too high because we yeah. need to we need to meet them at their brain state. Yeah. A lot of schools maybe don't know that, but hopefully the schools will pick up. So, yeah, we need to, and that, again, that's me bringing all, all in, the, in the brain stuff again. So, yeah, attachment and relationships, they need to be at the top, the yeah. very top. Yeah, I think so too. And just as a mom, you know, I know um, how it's important to me that I feel like the teachers like my kids, you know, and I think especially when they're small, they need to feel liked as well. Um, and and seen and kind of heard and important to the teacher yeah. and again some kids are easier to like than others some are that little bit more challenging to like because of yeah. the behaviors or dysregulation or yeah. maybe they have a condition or an undiagnosed something or other like autism that might make things a bit more challenging well, they'll give you a perfect example here right I had a pupil who was doing a lot of one-to-one myth and group work and she was she was very proud and she came in with a report card and um, she put a report card in front of us, and I was like, this is really good. And then she said to me, oh, look at our religious education. No kids maybe take TRE. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was very interesting. I said, you've got all top marks in RE. That's absolutely brilliant. She said to me, no, use the language. She said, I hate the subject. I said, you hate the subject, but you've got all top marks in it. No, she said, but I love my teacher. Mm-hmm. Does that not put relationship in the context where, where if a pupil comes into class, they don't like the subject, but in the context of relationships, you can get their cortex open. That's right, and yeah. Get access, and get and them the access. And want to learn and make them want to do their best. Yeah, it's really interesting. Really, mm-hmm. really interesting. But at any rate, uh, given the fact that not all schools are quite at the level of Clyde Bank with, you know, the, the nurture focus, the resilience focus, the mindfulness focus, the attachment festival and all of that, do you think that all schools, all teachers should have training and attachment and basic 
basic neuroscience. Oh, absolutely. Why not? We do it. We do it in our secondary schools. Um, so why should other secondary schools? And we, we've got the luxury, obviously, um, that we have nurture training for, for staff. Not only have we got a nurture group and I'm a nurture teacher and I've got an art teacher, which is really good. She comes in with me. Um, so that's really good. But we've also got nurture training for staff. They'll not do the full four-day training that we access because that costs a wee bit of an investment. Okay, mm -hmm. but we've set up our own six principles of nurture training okay. for staff. So they're accessing about the six principles of nurture where a uh, child, I tell the, the, the developmental side of things about relationships mm -hmm. and they get a bit of the science in that as well. And I'm also putting some of that as well. So when I'm maybe having, um, we've maybe got new teachers in, I maybe do a wee twilight with teachers and giving them, I'll run through my PowerPoint, mm -hmm. which is navigate the school environment, races and trauma and giving them a wee flavour of that as well. So we're, we're on a good journey with we, we mm -hmm. attachment and relationships and the science. Mm -hmm. I think you're still kind of um, pioneers, though, in the field, I suspect. Although Scotland is further ahead, perhaps, than some countries. So maybe there's more schools like yourselves. But I don't think there's too many in Ireland yet, <sighs> especially I'd, secondary schools that would no, have this kind of... I have a couple of primary schools. I have um, had a chat with a couple of primary schools just there last year. Um, about the resilience program and they have taken on, took it on board so okay. I'll talk to any school anywhere when I've got the time. Yeah sure I know you're 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 a passionate fellow about this as um as people are once they discover it I think oftentimes it's very hard to go back to the way of behaving and thinking and yeah. feeling uh, once you get this information. Yeah. So Dr. Bruce Perry, who, who I interviewed for the previous How to Talk Policy and Influence uh, People series, has a beautiful phrase, wonderful phrase that I regularly use myself about the optimal sequence of engagement. And that's not just for people with a trauma history. It's just for people in general. And it's especially good for kids who are dysregulated. And it's regulate, relate, reason. Is this sequence typically applied in classrooms, do you think, Jerry? And if not, why not? Well, no, um, in our school, I would say again, yes. Because <laughs> yeah. I've, obviously, but I've obviously been constantly putting out information and we have, um, we've got our own kind of school website and I've put a lot of Bruce Perry videos up. I've done a couple of wee exercises on explaining about regulate, relate, reason. Um, because that that's, the, the regulate, re relate, reason, it's, it's absolutely an amazing um, sequence how to, to regulate, and you you obviously need to be regulated yourself to co-regulate mm -hmm. with a young person. And I don't know if everyone is aware, but I would absolutely tell them to, to look it up and get Bruce Perry's books and get all these books, because I've read them. And um, and a perfect example, of people never seen the regulate, relate, reason sequence, is that I had a young person, um, or any young person comes into my room, and they're dysregulated, and you hear you always, that, that language is normal to me. I'm not going to say they were bad or angry or whatever, because obviously mm -hmm. there's no such thing as a bad child. They're just mm -hmm. misunderstood, okay? Mm -hmm. So the young person would come into my room, and they'd be shouting and bawling. So I had a, I had a thing about this a while ago, and they come in, they were shouting and bawling, um, dysregulated, and right away, I'm in with the brain-aware perspective. Okay, mm -hmm. where is this young person in the brain? Okay, they're down in the brainstem. Mm -hmm. Their uh, sympathetic nervous system's been activated. So I need to work for the bottom, okay? So I said to the young person, you know what I'm going to ask you to do? I'm going to give you a couple of wee breathing exercises because can, can we, as adults, can we engage with each other if we're mm. not regulated? We can't. No. If we're in brainstem or limbic, no, okay? Mm. So young person's in it and I'll say, I want you to take a wee seat a wee minute and they'll kind of know me anyway. And I said, right, I'm going to run you through a wee process, okay? What I want you to do is I'm going to give you a wee breathing exercise called 479, so it's in for four, we hold for seven, out for nine, whatever. Mm. Or it can do it short, you can do maybe three, five, yes. seven. The out breaths are all supposed to be longer. Or we'll do seven, 11. Mm. So but when I'll do that. So I'm seeing the shoulders going, they're breathing, breathing, and I'm just kind of having a wee look at my watch and saying, okay, right, how are you feeling now? Feeling a wee bit better, right, okay. And then I'll relate with them. I understand, yeah. I know what it's, it's, it's not a nice feeling to feel angry and I understand why you're angry and I don't understand why you're angry but I understand how you're feeling I know mm. it's like not a nice feeling to be angry and then I'm starting to relate with them then I'll say right another beat just another 10-15 seconds another few deep breaths dump 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 okay what's happened to you mm. 
here's what happened. Blah, 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 blah. And then they'll go through the story. Can you do that right away? You can. You need to be able to access the cortex through sequence. You need to get to the neural part, okay, before you can engage with a pupil. Yeah. As Bruce Perry would say, I love the way he does that. He talks about the upside down brain. And it's all yeah. about these parts, then you work your way up to the top. So, yeah, yeah. it's it's cannot regulate with a pupil until that cortex is, is accessible. And our staff understand that. Yeah, no, it's it's wonderful that they do because um, it's it's just not common knowledge. Uh, I, I don't think in general, you know, and as parents as well, it's not common knowledge. You know, we often try and reason with one another when we're yeah. in a dysregulated state or we, we try and express our needs or tell someone that we've been hurt at the wrong time when they're already in a flap. Um, but just in relation to young people, say teenagers, again, who, whose bodies are all tense, they're angry, they're shouting, they're upset for whatever reason. Are they quite open to doing the breaths? Because breath is the one thing we can control. So it is, yeah. it's such a vagal pathway to regulation. But I know when I was, when I was younger myself, I found it hard sometimes to breathe, you know, if I was, I, I was upset. Um, yeah. Any resistance from any young people, or do they generally I think, respond? Well? I think that our pupils are well um, clued up on it, is because of the mindfulness program in the school, okay. so they know. And what we've got, our program is called Dot B, okay, which means so it's a it's a red stop sign. What oh, one up in here? I've got something somewhere, and it's yeah. a red stop sign, and it's B, okay? okay. So it means two things. It means you stop and B, mm -hmm. okay. And it was our pupils that asked them to pop up the corridors because it was a trigger. When they were going to class dysregulated, mm. they would say, stop and breathe or stop and be. So that's right. what it means. And they're up about our school. And pupils know to access your cortex, you need to work. Our pupils know it. A pupil come into me amazingly, Jen, and say, Jen, I'm a bit dysregulated. Yeah, it's fabulous. It's very empowering to know how you feel and why you feel it. And that not, you're not broken because you feel that way as well. I think that we all have the capacity to be profoundly dysregulated and not rational and quite unpleasant when we're in those states. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, we, we always understand that if a pupil is dysregulated and they're, listen, they'll swear or whatever, but we we'll always explain to the staff and staff really understand this, that, that behaviour is not, that's not about you. Mm. That's about how they're feeling. They're just expressing how they're feeling in the only way they know how. Yeah. They don't need to do it any other way. We wish it could be better, but they're only they only they only get that through learning. Mm. I always say as young people know better, they'll do better. That's so true. And do you think that's a useful piece of information as well for people, especially you know, teachers who can bear the brunt of this dysregulation at times, that the it's not about you message. I mean, sometimes it can be, I guess, if a teacher is being very strict or maybe uh, unduly punitive, if, if you've forgotten a piece of your homework or your uniform isn't up to snuff. In some schools, that might be a thing. But often it's actually not about you. Your face might remind them of something from the past yeah. or your words, your tone. Oh, might... Or a smell of aftershave yeah. or a smell of perfume can trigger a, can trigger yeah. a memory. yeah. Is that useful, though, to know often that we are just something that, tend to, like Karen Traceman has this phrase about sending people down a time hole, um, you know, that it can be even something that's not at all conscious. The smell of the aftershave might be not something they've smelled for a really long time. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and the person themselves who's activated doesn't know that that's what's activating them, but that's what it is. Do you think teachers or other professionals um, on the front lines can find that useful information to, to kind of back away from their own hurt feelings maybe a little bit. Yeah, I think it's a really good thing for staff to understand because um, they have a dysregulated pupil in front of them and um, they're taking the brunt of how the young person's inner world is. Mm. Uh, um, don't take it personal. Mm. I don't take it personal. I mean, I would... Not a lot, yeah. uh, but I've maybe had people come to see me and they'll say, can I speak to you a wee minute? I said, I've got a wee, I'm doing a bit of work with a pupil or whatever I want to want or whatever's going on. And they maybe get, you don't bother with me. You don't want to ever see me and da, da, da. It's okay, that's just one of our bells going. Okay. Um, always, and I'll say to the girl, well, the, the other people, I, always, I don't take that personal. 
I know yeah. that's a young person's feeling. But if I've got the be just the be moments, just the be therapeutic moments, Jane, as I would say to the young person at the door, if they're a bit, look, I will come and see you next period. If I've got five minutes, yeah. I will come and see you and we'll have a wee chat. That's enough to send them away. What does it say? Every it's one of Karen trees, I mean, she's every every interaction and intervention. Yeah. And um, most of the therapeutic moments, the, the other one, most of the therapeutic moments don't take place in therapy, yeah. they take place in oh, schools. Yeah. D in, D out, relational moments made a difference. Yes, so so true. Uh, and again, I think we can get frustrated at times and go, oh, there's all this need, all this mental health need. You know, I'm not a profession, I'm not a social worker, I'm not a therapist. But that message is so empowering, actually. Every interaction yeah. is an intervention and the therapeutic moments don't mm -hmm. most often occur in therapy. You need to be a psychiatrist or whatever, so, just the moments, they drip, they drip feeding of the relational moments make a difference. Yeah, and, and, and connecting human to human and caring and, and being kind and compassionate goes such a, such a long way. In your work, what would you say the value of the adverse childhood experiences evidence base is is it is it useful absolutely um and what i would say about um, the aces movement i was absolutely blown away when i went to the ace aware nation i think you attended it yourself ace aware I nation did. in glasgow yeah, that was the first this. one so um, we were on our kind of we were on our journey a wee bit at that time so we managed to get some tickets for it i went with my with my, my line manager and we went to the event and i was absolutely blown away and it's when i was at that event i said i'm I'm fully in here, mm. as, as James Think said. He's, he's thing he took a deep dive, so yeah. I also took a deep dive because uh, um, there was so much. We were working with Nadine Burke Harris, we had James Docker, we had so many good people up in that stage. Or there are countless ones to remember. Um, I could I could be here all day talking about, but the whole event was great. And then with the Gabor Matty one at the back of that. Mm. So uh, listen to them and Aces. I heard a wee bit about Aces, but I wasn't fully. Mm. clued up on it all but yeah and then you did start to look so we're talking about adverse childhood experiences here this is more about it's not what's wrong with you but what's happened to you yeah and that quote's so so important as well so yeah absolutely it's it's, it's had a big, big impact in our school as well about the staff understanding about about adverse childhood experiences and again pupils who generally come with adverse childhood experiences of oversensitized stress responses as well. Yeah. So we're going to get back to the body and, and the, the parasympathetic, sympathetic nervous systems. A lot of these pupils, um, the lower density of their brains are oversensitized. Mm. And there's a quote I use, and I use it with staff, and I use it with other people who have spoken to many schools. And when we're into the science, we're talking about the brain, we're talking about behavior and whatever else. No we'll say, it's not about changing the behavior, it's about healing mm. the brain. Mm. And once you heal the brain, then you'll see changes in behaviour. So mm. it's about getting these oversensitised parts of the brain regulated. And then we start to go into the whole thing about neuroplasticity. Yeah. So ACEs is very important for, for any school to understand that there's no what's wrong with it. these young people. It's absolutely what's happened to them. And adults as well, who sure. they've sure. been impacting sure. in there. And, they're, and we, we get back to the start when we're talking about the, the, the adults in young people's lives. Some of these adults who had kids have not had any help and they're carrying their trauma into to the, into the young people, uh, the mm. care force trauma as well. And then it becomes an intergenerational cycle. Mm. Yeah, all too often it is. But the power of, I think, the psychoeducation dimension to kind of the ACEs movement is like, okay, not every single childhood adversity is covered in the original 10 ACEs. Poverty isn't covered, racism isn't covered, war isn't in the original one, in the ACE IQ they are. Um, but at least it opens a conversation. And for those who've had a high level adversity, they can go, ah, that's why. That's why I've had yes. struggles with mental health or addiction um, mm -hmm. and why, why I find it hard to trust people. But it needn't be the way forevermore because, you know, change is possible and our brains well, are plastic. Keep jumping on the quotes here, but the quotes are so so important for people understanding. Was, was it Tina Henry? Poor outcomes aren't inevitable. Yeah. And, then, uh, and I use that quote a bit with young, some young people I work with. It doesn't mean to say what's happened in your past is going to again happen in the future. Mm -hmm. There's yes. change, then, and, and we teach our pupils a lot about neuroplasticity as well. Lots mm -hmm. about neuroplasticity, and it shows them um, your brain is malleable, your brain can change. Okay, yeah. it's not easy, but through repetition, learning new skills, mm -hmm. your brain can adapt and change. Yeah. 
And it just strikes me again how fortunate the kids in your school are, though, because they're getting this information at an early stage from adults who care about them and understand the importance of relationships, because that's the other the kind of newer part of the um, ACEs uh, science now is the positive childhood experiences and relationships are central. Like we hear about one good adult, but really we all need more than one ideally in our lives. One can mm -hmm. make a huge difference, but if all the teachers and staff at your school are ACE aware, um, neurodevelopmentally aware and trauma informed to a degree, well, the capacity of those adults to be kind and compassionate is, is, is greatly increased than if they don't have the information. I, so we're I looking back to the village, aren't we? The village quote, it's yeah. a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. So it's everybody, uh, a, lot, a lot of people are involved in the young person's life. Yeah. Given where you, you guys are at in your journey with, you know, building all these building blocks to help kids and help staff understand kids, what are your views in general of the merits of um, attachment training, stuff around interpersonal neurobiology, which is kind of Dan Siegel's uh, concept, ACEs and trauma for all teachers and other school staff. Do you think it should be kind of mandatory or part of the basic basic training? Yes, uh, absolutely. Because um, the, yeah, at the end of the day, you're dealing with brains. If we're going to strip it down to the science, we're dealing with brains and bodies here, aren't we? And kids are coming for a lot of adversity. Um, as we spoke about earlier, there's kids coming from Households are managing, but the kids maybe not getting the love and connection that they should be getting. So that's showing up in behaviour as well. So we always look beneath the behaviour. But to look to, to do that, you need to understand a bit of the science. And mm. listen, we're not asking teachers to be, or members of staff to be therapists or whatever. Mm. A wee, I think a wee bit understanding of how the brain develops and how we regulate really, really reason with a young person, how we understand that time out, oh, we call time out exclusion, we call time out, or putting them out of class and mm. whatever, that only exacerbates the stress. That's only exacerbating how they're feeling inside. So I always say more time in, compassion, mm. understanding, healing, relationships, daily to recovery. Or I always say, you know, I'll come back to be quotes. I never say to a young person, I'm going to fix things, right? Because that's the wrong information I'm going to give them. But what I can do is try and make things better for you. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So yes, yeah. it's so important. I, when we were talking about Jean, sorry to jump in. I had done a, I done a seminar for the University of Glasgow, and it was with second year, under primary undergraduates, and they really took a lot from that. So, yeah, that was about four weeks ago. Done a, a seminar with 140 of them about, about brain development. Yeah, no, excellent. I I just think it's really fascinating information for people as well. Uh, and again, to reflect on how we are in the world at times. You know, I when I do talks, I ask people to think about a time that you were really stressed and tune into your body as well. Where did you feel the stress? Was it in your heart pounding, your ears pounding, sweating, you know, in your stomach or whatever? Um, because for a child who grew up in a chaotic environment or a really highly stressed community, they're in those type of feelings a lot, like their body yeah. is... Highly and survival, aren't they? Yeah, back to the yeah. Back to the tiger. Yeah, yeah, and it does give people just a little sense of how, if I was that unpleasant because my internet connection um, went down in the middle of a presentation or something, and I got all in a flap. What's it like when there's a real serious situation or a real threat, or you're being humiliated or you know abused in some mm. way? It just it just gives a little. Are we working out a lot, Jane? We mm -hmm. working at a lot, but the pupils feeling emotions, and I've got I call it the hot cross bun. It's on my board at the other side, but we call it stress. Usually starts with by thought alone. Mm -hmm. Okay, by thought alone. What's that saying? Your thoughts can make you well, or your thoughts can make you sick. Mm -hmm. Okay, so by thought alone, you create a feeling, mm -hmm. anxiety, worry, stress. Then that feeling becomes an emotion, butterflies, mm -hmm. stuff, and then it can become a behaviour: fight, mm -hmm. flight, freeze. Mm. So we help pupils, I help pupils run through that process. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's from the CBT model. Yeah, yeah, very good. Well, it's interesting that you combine the CBT with the, the uh, physiological stuff and, and neuroscience, because um, certainly in the criminal justice system, 
for a long time, there was a focus on CBT without an understanding of the bottom up survival responses. And of course, if we're not in our cortex or you might absorb information when you're safe, but it flies out of your head the moment you're threatened as well. So yeah. the co combination of the two is 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 really interesting. Um, so just to go back to the nurture focus briefly, it, are you in a nurture room there? Is that a nurture room or, or is, is yeah, it? This is my, I'm, in, I'm in my nurture base at the moment. Um, I wish I could show you around, but I can't. Yeah. Um, Zedex put a nice um, tweet up a good while ago. We had a festival and she was doing a tour of the nurture room. So yeah, yeah this is my nurture base at the moment. Again, hopefully we can manage this. So, so I've got my brain here with all the regulate, relate reason stuff yeah. behind you. Um, and I've got another one here again, Lovely. which is showing a lot of pupils about the brain as well. So, my work is all based around that because the kids know I've got brains all over my room, um, <laughs> brains and nervous systems. Very and all diamond, the brain guy, yeah, so important for the kids to understand this, really is, and staff, yeah. But the nurture uh, room concept, I think, or, or approach is growing in popularity in a lot of places. Um, why do you think this is? Is is the brain a central part of the nurture approach in general, or is that something you've brought in, Jerry? No, it's always been a part of uh, part Has of my nurture okay. intervention because uh, yeah. yeah, it's always been a part because again, many kids who come across me have got underlying neuropsychological conditions. So what okay. does that tell us? The brain is underdeveloped. Hmm. They maybe have a chronic chronological age of. 14, 13, okay. but they've got a developmental age of six. Okay. So it's a bit playing catch up and, and catching up with these these um parts of the, the parts of development that missed out on growing up. Mm -hmm. Neuroplasticity is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And would there be kids in the nurture room with ADHD or things like autism as well? Not so much. Generally, generally no autism. They maybe do other work with the, learning, the other learning support teams, but okay. generally it's we maybe have kids with ADHD in it, and that's another thing. But we could open the whole. We've not got we've not got long enough to talk about yeah. ADHD and, and adverse childhood experience because we know there are a bit of a crossover for that, yeah. and that, that's for another time possibly. But um, it's me to understand that where they are developmentally and where yeah. I want them to reach, but. Right. I need to do that from a brain aware perspective. Is that brain aware perspective really central to why the, the nurture room approach is, is taking off? Do you think that it is kind of more child centered and just helps bring them, bring them along and help them um, be in a, a better position to reach the potential that they do have if they get the right supports in a timely yeah, way? Yeah, well, the brain aware perspective helps. I say we two, two are pupils who were on. Um, Tiger and Teddy series and two of people's were on having a talking about the brain and what they've learned, talking about regulation and relate and reason and all these sort of things. But one one of the major things about the, the nurture the nurture room is one of the principles is a safe base. It has to be a safe base first of all because you've got pupils coming with all sorts of um, dysregulation and and they're in, they're in hyper they're either in hyper they're either hyper arousal or they're hypo. And it's mm -hmm. about working with that. Um, so I do a lot of work with them through a lot of work on the, the um, what do you call it? Maybe I'm looking for the word for it. I mean, there are two sizes, the red and green, and you've got the middle part. Um, I'm not sure, but we do a lot of what that is. But we do a lot about body regulation with them. But talking about the safe base, that's that's the most important thing. The pupils have to feel safe. No one can come into our nurture room, not even mm -hmm. the head teacher, not okay. any member of staff. That has to be really urgent. Mm. Okay, because that ha safe base has to be kept, yeah. and these young people could begin to open it up. And, when, and it's amazing when you've got these young people in and they're eating their toast and tea. And some people might not eat toast and tea when they come, but they build up the, the confidence to I can have a bit of toast because they might not eat in front of other kids either. Sure. And so you're building the relationships. I mean, you build the relationships and the trust. They will then start to unfold some of their well, some of their worries and stress. Um, and you can't do that if you've got people coming out of the room. So sure. a safe brace is crucial and we need to understand that learning is understood developmentally. Mm. Meet these young people with their brains at, don't set their expectations too high because it really needs to mirror where mm. their brain, de brain development's at. Mm. Yeah. And again, like uh, just an example from my own recent life of where 
you know, I had been nicely regulated and then I had a technical glitch where I didn't save a PowerPoint and I needed it for a presentation. I was completely tense and dysregulated. Uh, the person next to me would have seen it in how I was bracing and kind of probably not really breathing properly. And I managed to pull it together and put the slides down. Mm -hmm. But a tiny example of how unpleasant it feels yeah. with minor stress. Just as you're saying that, Jane, yeah. what the word I was looking what what the word I was looking for, well, what was like, we learn them about their window of tolerance. Yeah. That's where I was trying to get to. So you, used, you were talking about that, about tightness in the body and all of that. We learned pupils about their window of tolerance. So we learn them about hyperarousal and hypo. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so if I've got a young, if a young, people's got, young person's maybe no managing in class, and then I can relate to my board and relate to my whiteboard when that's on, sorry, my, my, my overhead projector, mm -hmm. and start to show them their window of tolerance. And they can say to me, that's where I was. I yeah. actually was shutting down. Yeah. I wasn't I wasn't listening to teaching. My brain just shut down and I can say, well, this was what's happening. Here's how we can manage to work our way out of that. Yeah, and it's it's fabulous information because we all experience that from time to time where we can't hear people talking to us. You know, we literally can't hear it. And how because are you Because the cortex is closed. Yeah. When when you're in a classroom, how can you learn if you're you're just Hyper aroused or hypo aroused for whatever reason. Well, another thing, Jane, very quickly here, because we're probably running out of time. Mm -hmm. How can a pupil learn when they're shouting in the classroom as well, or when a teacher shouts at them? Yes. Okay. So what I'm understanding with the pupil, because they'll say to me, How do you never shout? And I said, Because here's the reason why I don't shout. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because it may impact someone in the room, first mm -hmm. of all. And I'll explain a wee bit about it. When I talk to you, these sound waves are coming. Okay. Mm -hmm. So where do they go? And they'll say to me, oh, they're in your ears. Yeah. So these sound waves, I'm talking to you in a regulated, calm tone of voice. Okay. They go in your ears. So say, where do they go next? Let's have a look at my board. Okay. So I'll pull down my laptop and they'll, they'll say blue, purple or red. Where does it go? And they'll have a wee guess. So I'll say, no, it goes in the brainstem first. Mm. So that's, so my voice is going in your brainstem. You're saying I'm safe. My emotional brain's safe because the person I'm working with, I've got a good relationship with them. He's talking to me in a nice, calm tone of voice. And then your cortex is open. But if I'm shouting and bawling, okay, or you're maybe one of you are bringing your phone out, and I call them dopamine devices in the school. And the <laughs> why do you call it a dopamine device? No so true. I'll, I'll, explain, I'll explain to them why. Yeah. So I said, if I shout to you, it's not going to get by your emotional brain. Yeah. Because you're going to be stressed and worried. That's yeah. why I don't shout. That's why I'll always have a calm tone of voice for you guys. Mm. It's an amazing accomplishment, though. I mean, that takes personal work. It, it, it helps to know it, but it, it's a whole different ball game, you know, to stay regulated in the face of provocations, you know. Um, and then I to you, what's my mum and dad knew about this? <laughs> well, but indeed. That's what we're looking at as well, Jim. You're looking at the, 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 the pandemic put a wee bit of a, a block on that so we were looking to do a lot of work with the parents as well giving them the tools very good very good um finally jerry because you, you, we're we are um a bit out of time or we've we could keep going for a long time though i know oh, you and i <laughs> a fair long time uh what do you think politicians and policy makers could do to promote safe healthy uh relationships in childhood and across the lifespan Giving more, getting more information out there. But okay. then they bring it back to funding, don't they? Mm. They bring it back to the whole money, the money, mm. the money situation. And that's what that's what makes the world go around is money. But how do we how do we make how do we make money available for parents to access mm. more courses in brain development? Um their caregivers, eh? How they can learn to build healthy relationships with the young people in their life, um, how to give the adults stress response capabilities. Um, as I were on about that, I'm doing a wee bit of work in my own community. Um, I'm doing it with kids just now. So I do a wee bit of work outside the school, learning kids about brain development and how to manage stress. So we're going to be running that with the parents as well. Parents need to know, um, but it's it's getting the right people behind it. And then you've, you've got the money as well. The money's a situation, but they're investing money in these other things, which yeah. is I'm not going down a political road, yeah. But let's look at how we're going to help these families and poorer communities mm -hmm. to, to give these young people the best start in life that they possibly can. 
yeah. and the parents the tools. Indeed, indeed. We've got because to get it right for the parents, Jim. We need to we need to get it right for the parents because uh, I find sometimes in my job that I'm sometimes just resetting young people. Hmm. You reset them, then they're going back home, and then they're yeah. in the morning. You reset them again. So we need to see what can we do for the the parents and and the caregivers in these young people's lives. Mm. Indeed, indeed, um, show a bit of compassion for them and their needs, and help them Absolutely. heal some of the yeah. wounds that they have. So yeah, that... they, need, they may need their own trauma mm. looked at and help with that, and uh, give them a bit more understanding how how they are managing their behaviours and and it's just giving them the skills. I mean, mm. it's we need to start the, somewhere. Yeah, and the relational support sometimes, I think, as well, because the caregivers need someone to care for them as well. And sometimes yeah, it's and hard. Trying to get parents into school to maybe do a bit of group work and they maybe feel vulnerable and a bit ashamed. But no, we're not here to shame people. Mm. That's not, not in our schools mm. to shame any people. But here's how we can support you to best support your young person yeah. and, you, and, and your, your house. Well, Jerry, thank you so much uh, for all you do. And thanks to your colleagues as well for taking this heart-centered approach. I think it's the way forward myself. Um, but this has been a relationship, a Relationships Matter with me, Jane Mulcahy, and my guest today has been the wonderful Jerry Diamond. It's been an absolute thank pleasure, you. Jerry. Thank okay. you. Thanks very much for inviting me on, Jane. Thank you, Jerry. It really, yeah. it's it's great work that you're doing. So thank you for sharing it with thank me and, and the audience.